All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Gabriel Netcast, the Committee for Sydney. Um, I'm going to stall for about 30 seconds just to let everybody um, get into the system. But um, we're so excited today that we have um, Planning Minister Rob Stokes uh, joining to make an announcement um, supporting industry during COVID-19. Um, I hope everybody is uh, managing okay. I am broadcasting to you live from my 13-year-old son's bedroom. Uh, managed to turn the camera away from the white wall or from the uh, mess of the room to show you just the white walls. Um, I've had some amazing conversations with um, powerful CEOs in uh, princess-decorated bedrooms this over the past week. So it's um, quite remarkable what we are all uh, adjusting to. So um, I want to remind everybody that you um, do have the ability to submit questions via the Zoom app. And uh, those will come to me and I will do my best to sort them out and combine them and we'll get through as many as we can. Um, with this, let me uh, turn to an introduction of Rob Stokes. Rob is a member for Pittwater and Minister for Planning and Public Spaces. Prior to his appointment, he was Minister for Education, Minister for the Environment, and Minister for Heritage. He was previously a lawyer and academic in environment and planning law, and holds a lifelong interest in environmental land use planning, heritage, and sustainability. Um, he is a very good friend of the committee, and to many of you joining today, we are honored to have him here today. And with that, I now turn it over to you, Minister Stokes. Thank you, Gabriel, and thank you to everyone for tuning in and to the Committee for Sydney for hosting this event uh, and pulling it together so quickly. That's, I guess, one of the benefits of living in a socially distant world. We're forced to use technology which can be a great enabler for getting things done and getting things done quickly. Um, I thought it was important for me to address you all today to talk about the role that the planning system has to play in the COVID-19 crisis, because our system and the construction and, uh, uh, and development industry and property industry more broadly is one of the key tools that the government has uh, in, uh, in, in keeping people in jobs, in keeping businesses running and keeping the economy ticking over. Uh, during the, the crisis, I have the ability through some changes rushed through Parliament uh, just last week or the week before, they all sort of merge into one at the moment, uh, to issue ministerial orders that override the planning system where it is in the interest of the community for health, safety or wellbeing. In the past week, uh, to provide some examples, I've issued orders to allow supermarkets and pharmacies uh, and, and food providers to operate around the clock and receive deliveries and conduct waste removal 24-7. Uh, we certainly had some issues that uh, arose in relation to, to waste uh, piling up, so we had to facilitate that waste being moved as well. We've also introduced greater flexibility for small businesses working from home in terms of operating hours and numbers of staff. You can go from, from two to now five in a home-based office provided, um, uh, pro provided that uh, um, uh, uh, you can continue to operate safely. Um, and yesterday I made two more orders to help businesses operate more flexibly during the crisis. One order supports the hard hit food and beverage industry to allow food trucks to operate on any land at any time, provided there's landowners consent, uh, and also to allow dark kitchens or ghost kitchens uh, to be set up in any commercial kitchen. So that might be in a community centre, in a church hall, uh, and it's one way in which we can help the catering business and the restaurant business that's been particularly hard hit, and also provide more food options for the community. The other order was targeted at the construction industry, allowing for sites to operate on weekday hours, uh, to operate weekday hours on weekends and public holidays. Uh, this is designed to help sites spread their work across a greater number of hours to ensure they can maintain both productivity and timelines around construction, uh, but also, and most importantly, uh, to allow tradies and employees 
to work, uh, to, to maintain social distancing rules on job sites. Uh, of course, that's done uh, as well, recognising the need on weekends and public holidays uh, not to operate things like pile driving and, uh, and rock cutting, but so, so that trades, for example, can go in on the weekends uh, and do some plumbing work or carpentry or whatever it might be. But today I want to talk about what's next. Uh, at the moment, we're all being told what we can't do. Our lives are increasingly constrained. It's easy then to slide into lethargy and, and pessimism. But to urbanists, constraints actually create opportunities. Uh, give an architect at an empty greenfield site with no constraints, and you'll often end up with a fairly mundane, uh, unimaginative design. But give the same architect a site full of constraints and limitations and problems and restrictions, and you'll often find that those very constraints inspire creativity, vision and energy. In the same way, uh, the COVID-19 uh, response is quite explicitly focused on what we can't do. We can't go to the cinema or the theatre or the gym or a knock-off drink with friends or dinner at a restaurant. We can't operate certain businesses or come within uh, sort of 90 centimetres, oh, sorry, 1.5 metres of the next person. Uh, therefore, in planning, our duty during the pandemic is to think about what we can do. We can cut red tape to provide businesses with flexibility. We can override normal processes to help keep people in jobs and the economy moving. And we can process so many projects and proposals that have been stuck in the system for too long. And the beauty is having fewer applications coming in right at the moment means that we have an unprecedented opportunity to actually get through so many things that have piled up uh, with, with so much coming in uh, into the system and not enough going out the other side. This is an incredible opportunity and we need to think of it in those ways uh, to get through uh, those projects that are awaiting uh, consideration or partway through consideration uh, so that we have a, a, a huge pipeline of projects ready to power us into recovery on the other side of this. I want to be clear, though, um, that this is what we do. We haven't slowed down. In the past two weeks alone, the department's finalised 19 projects, enabling the creation of 1,900 jobs or, or more, in fact, and injecting more than $1.2 billion into the economy. That means since the beginning of this year, since uh, the, the beginning of January, the planning system has finalised 142 uh, major projects, enabling the, the creation of about 4,500 jobs and injecting about $4 billion into the New South Wales economy. I think for too long, the planning system has been characterised as, as something that inhibits or stops development. The way I see it is it's an enabler of development. It's just enabling development that we want to see. It's enabling sustainable development, enabling development that's actually making people's lives better and not the reverse. So let's take this opportunity that a planning system enables and focus on we, what we can do to get through not just the weeks and months ahead, but also the years of economic recovery that we'll face as well. Uh, now, many of you, like me, will have tuned in to hear the great uh, Professor Richard Florida speak through a committee for Sydney event earlier this week. And one thing that stuck out to me uh, from, 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 that, uh, from, from that call is that if we look back to our recent history, we know that the economic calamity that COVID-19 has brought us will also have a silver lining at the end of it. Uh, as Professor Florida said, people forget that the Spanish flu uh, came before the roaring 1920s. Uh, so, you know, that last great pandemic uh, with worldwide implications actually was, was followed by a period of enormous uh, economic growth and recovery and, and, uh, and also so social and cultural development as well. So then here in New South Wales, what's the New South Wales government going to, to do uh, or how are we going to support the industry to focus on what can be done so we get to the roaring 2020s faster? My commitment to you today is that our short term plan to cut red tape and fast track normal processes will create opportunities for more than 30,000 construction jobs in the next six months that we will fast track assessments of state significant developments, rezonings and development applications. And I'll make decisions on some of those personally if required. 
We'll support councils and planning panels to fast track locally and regionally significant development applications. Uh, for example, hosting an omnibus planning panel meetings in April to clear as many local DAs as possible. Uh, to expedite the COVID-19 planning response by expanding the list of works that can be carried out without the need for planning approval or under the fast track complying development pathway. To introduce a one-stop shop for industry to progress projects that may be stuck in the system. To clear the current backlog of cases stuck in the Land and Environment Court with uh, additional acting commissioners and to also crucially invest $70 million to co-fund the vital new community infrastructure in northwest Sydney, including roads, um, trunk uh, drainage, public parks, to unlock plans for the construction of thousands of new homes. So uh, I'll be working with the peak bodies, uh, particularly as well, the Committee for Sydney and the Department, on what can be fast-tracked over the next couple of weeks. The things that we're focused on are projects that can create jobs. Uh, that breathe new life into the retail and commercial sectors to help them reju rejuvenate when we come out the other side of this. One of the things that Professor Florida also reflected on uh, was the role of main streets. And this is something that I'm particularly concerned about. Uh, we've seen retail trade obviously decimated as a result of the pandemic. And we need to think very, very quickly and, uh, and very, very uh, uh, proactively about what we can do to breathe new life into our our, our retail and commercial CBDs. Um, I, I, as a recovering lawyer, it's important I provide a disclaimer, and that is uh, to make no guarantees of what will be approved or not. Um, so this is not about approving everything. This is about making sure that everything comes to a decision point as quickly as possible. Uh, and obviously, those projects that bring real benefits and are in the public interest, well, they will be top of the list in terms of what is likely to be approved. But it's important that I make that, that point. But if something's been stuck in the system for too long for no good reason and can create jobs uh, and, uh, and precincts for our future cities, uh, then you know, my clear message is to, uh, to, to work with your industry body to bring them to our attention. The focus should be on jobs, not on homes specifically. Homes are important. Uh, obviously, we've got a growing population uh, but certainly the jobs that creation of homes or creation of, of, of other developments uh, uh, create is, is what the real focus of this call to arms is all about. We have an incredible opportunity to help keep our state's economy moving uh, and keeping people in jobs and, uh, and also keeping businesses operating. We can't do it alone. Uh, and I'd urge everyone to collaborate and work together so that when we come out the other side and have the roaring 2020s, we'll be able to look back and be proud of what we've achieved together. Thanks a lot. Okay, wow. Um, thank you, Minister. Um, and I've got a bunch of questions coming in. Um, uh, but uh, this is frankly, going to be uh, incredibly welcome news by industry. Um, if um, if uh, indeed you can figure out how to fast track all of these, all of those different types of uh, planning approvals, um, yeah, it's what you said. It's one of the things that's actually not blocked. So many forms of action are blocked right now, and this is not. Um, I would also note that um, so many of the things that need doing cost government money, and this does not. This unleashes private investment. Um, all right, a first question about the IPC hearings. Um, and this actually is something I've been hearing a lot about too from our members. We're hearing people are stuck at IPC and that there has been a legal interpretation that those cannot go to online hearings. Um, can you break that logjam? Uh, yeah, so, uh, I mean, generally the IPC is a decision maker like the court, like panels. Uh, the court, for example, has been uh, doing uh, online, uh, using um, uh, sort of digital technology to receive evidence for many years. Um, I don't see any legal impediment for, to the IPC doing the same. Uh, and my encouragement is that, as I said in my presentation, this is the opportunity to process applications, to actually get them through the system. Um, there have been calls by some groups that, oh, we should stop assessing things now because of the, the COVID crisis and people don't have the opportunity to participate that they do, for example, in a public hearing. 
um, I don't actually agree. I actually think there are incredible opportunities to participate. In fact, for many of us, there, there, there's not a lot of other things we can do. Um, so we can actually participate in planning processes in ways that we haven't been able to otherwise. And the exciting thing is that often the voices that we haven't heard, um, people who have been busy at work, for example, um, will have the opportunity to participate in ways that they haven't otherwise. So my encouragement to every decision maker um, is, uh, is, is let's conduct those online hearings. Um, I, my understanding is that the legal interpretation is that uh, having a public hearing online is perfectly acceptable. Um, the point is ensuring that people uh, can be heard uh, and are listened to by the people making the decisions. And I see no reason as to why that can't happen uh, online uh, in, the, in the way that we're doing now. Okay, that's great um, because I think there are some projects then that have been stuck at IPC and if that can that can become unstuck, that's quite significant. Well, and, and so some of the things that I should mention here, the IPC review that the Productivity Commission did for us, um, we were, were very clear that we needed to act quickly on that. Um, just this week, in fact, the IPC has been set up uh, as a separate agency, which was one of the recommendations of the review. Um, and uh, we've already gone through the process of ensuring that the IPC only get those things um, that are uh, are, are truly of, uh, of, of state significance in that respect. So things like modifications are no longer going to the IPC, uh, which will also speed up the IPC's processes. Okay, that's great. All right, next question. Is there a risk that construction could be shut down as part of a later stage of restriction? I would note that um, in San Francisco, where I'm from, indeed they did that last week. Um, what are you what are you hearing and thinking about that? Uh, well, um, our job is to do what we can right now with what we know. Um, and so um, the, uh, the, 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 you know, we shouldn't panic, but we should act with urgency. Uh, and that's why we're doing everything we can to keep things going now. I can't uh, look into a crystal ball as to as to what uh, further restrictions might be in the pipeline. I can say from everything I know at this stage, uh, there are no plans to go further. Uh, and that, uh, again, um, the advice that I've received to date uh, is that the restrictions that we have in place are doing what they are designed to achieve and that there is no need to look to go any further at this stage. Uh, but, you know, that, that should inspire us all with a sense of urgency that every day matters. Yeah, you know, my conversations with contractors um, are that the workforce is... Uh, very, very grateful that they have not been shut down and that it actually is a controlled environment where you can manage uh, for social distancing or I should say physical distancing. Um, so it seems like there should be a way through careful management to yeah. keep the industry going. Well, and Gabe, to, to add to that, um, I was just come off a, uh, a conference call just earlier this morning with the planning ministers. There's uh, all the uh, uh, com all the national planning ministers get together uh, once a week during this crisis, and uh, at that forum, uh, it was made very clear that there are no plans uh, for further shutdowns that would affect the construction industry. Um, so that should be encouraging news for those listening. But of course, I, I don't have a crystal ball, uh, but that was the latest advice from about half an hour ago. Okay, well, good. Um, all right, next question. Um, there are some unsolicited proposals, some USPs sitting with DPC. Um, as part of your plan, uh, what is your thinking about those? Uh, so um, I, I can't uh, obviously reflect on cabinet discussions, but I can tell you my view is, um, and, uh, and obviously that goes out of my particular Valley Week, but I've made it very clear that uh, we should look to every lever we have right now um, as part of, you know, we know that tourism, we know that uh, um, retail trade, we know that entertainment have all been parts of our economy that have been particularly hard hit. So that means that the, the other bits of the economy that are still moving need to do even more heavy lifting. And so if there are unsolicited proposals, uh, and there are a great number of them, um, but there are certainly some that are much more well advanced. Uh, my clear message is, is let's uh, let's get them determined as quickly as possible and get them into the planning system out of the USP process. Um, but for, for obvious uh, probity reasons, that's not something I, I deal with specifically. But I'm keen, uh, you know, my message to DPC is get me proposals uh, so that we can we can push them through the system. Okay. 
All right, next question. Um, in the GFC, councils were able to mobilize quickly to undertake small construction projects. However, many small projects like cycleways require REF. Will this requirement be temporarily suspended if councils are implementing already approved strategies? Yes, yeah, so in relation to part, uh, the, old, the part five approvals, there's still part five approvals, um, my, uh, my encouragement to councils is we need to be flexible here. Uh, and uh, our interpretation of the RAF provisions need to be obviously mindful of the times that we're operating in. Um, that will depend from project to project, uh, and this is where council officers need to use common sense, uh, where um, we need our councillors to also um, just be wise in the way in which we look at these projects. And the sorts of concerns that, uh, that, that we might have, uh, I, I suppose, um, what's the right word here? Um, that, that we, we, we might have entertained six months ago uh, are not things that we should be particularly concerned about now. Um, we need to focus on jobs. Obviously, we need to have a long-term view and not do anything that's going to create unacceptable environmental impacts. Um, but um, we shouldn't just do process for the sake of process. Uh, it's very much in a time when outcomes matter. Okay, next question. I have so many questions. I have more than we'll be able to get through by 10 times, but trying to pick some that I think, think are especially, um, might be interesting for you. Um, all right, with this cyclical downturn, one risk is that you uh, solve the approval bottlenecks and find a way to give approval, but the private financing falls apart. And, and uh, um, so that you, you hit those problems in the market. Um, is there any consideration to um, reducing uh, development contributions um, as part of this um, in order to help some of the projects remain viable? Well, so, I mean, the first <laughs> part of my announcement, uh, part of my announcement today was that we're putting an extra $70 million into, um, into facilitating community infrastructure. So we're actually addressing that head on. Uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, further development contribution reform, that's a piece of work that the Productivity Commission is currently undertaking. Uh, and so we, you know, we'll have more to say about that uh, in the longer term. But also, this is, a, this is something that involves um, all of us working together, and that includes banks in terms of finance. And I know that they're doing quite a bit in terms of uh, providing as much flexibility uh, to, their, uh, to, to, to their customers as possible. Um, and, uh, and so that's my best answer to that one. Okay. Um, Minister, you've done a lot of work about this notion of missing middle housing. Um, missing middle housing, sometimes thought of as, as a modern version of the beloved Paris house. Um, but, you know, various, various design formats. Um, is there any opportunity to bring, uh, bring that back in this time um, and uh, somehow implement a more permissive code to allow missing middle housing. Yeah, so I'm very pleased to, um, uh, to to tell everyone listening that on the 1st of July this year, the missing middle code comes into effect. Uh, and uh, and so that, that very long process is coming to a conclusion that'll facilitate lots more opportunities for that style of housing. Some councils have come to us uh, with ideas of how they believe they can do it better. Uh, and we're progressing those uh, planning proposals that those councils have, uh, have, have put in. Uh, this whole code was actually designed to elicit a response from local government to say, well, we are doing this, uh, and unless you can come up with a better idea of how you want to achieve the same thing, and some have taken that. Uh, some have actually, I, I have to say, have actually just sought to delay and delay and delay, and have said, oh, we'll come up with a proposal, but they haven't. Uh, we've been more than reasonable in giving plenty of time uh, for councils to submit alternative proposals. Um, and some have, and some are, are good and are being processed. Um, but for those that haven't taken that opportunity, uh, well, the code's coming into effect on the 1st of July. And I think this current crisis uh, means that that decision is pretty timely. Okay. Um, Minister, are there any, this is an interesting question somebody posed, are there any planning decisions that have been made, like precinct plans, where you think you want to rethink a decision? Does this, does this moment, make you think there's anything that you want to go back and do differently now? Uh, well, I, I don't really have that luxury. Um, I, uh, 
uh, one day I'll retire and then I'll have an opportunity to think back uh, about things that might have been diff done differently. But I think now's the time for action, not reflection. Uh, and, uh, you know, different times of, of, uh, of, of the cycle, we can do different things. Right now is not the time to be looking back. A um, couple of questions about RMS slash transport referral as a source of delays, which you would have been hearing about for many years. Um, do, do you have any thoughts about how to, um, how to minimize the delay from that part of the process? Yeah, so one thing that we, uh, we have set up and announcing to, uh, and I announced my comments today is this one-stop shop, uh, if you like, a concierge service uh, for people with frustrations with different agencies. We'll be able to come straight to planning, raise those concerns, uh, uh, and we will shine a light on that, and I will take it up with, uh, with ministers if necessary. Um, but that is one of the challenges, one of the long-term challenges in the planning system is that uh, the planning department obviously uh, has KPIs around getting uh, projects uh, through the system, uh, but RMS doesn't, or the old RMS, doesn't necessarily have the same drivers. Uh, that changes from today. Um, Minister, several variants on this question. Um, in the rush to action, um, how do you make sure that you are uh, maintaining quality? How do you make sure that you're still making the right decisions? Well, that's why, um, I mean, that's why, for example, uh, design is one now one of the objects of the Act. Uh, it's why we have, um, and I know the frustrations around uh, instruments like uh, SEP 65 and like the basics requirements, but they are there for a reason. And I think sometimes, even though we get frustrated with some of these instruments from time to time, and certainly the Department Design Guide, for example, is exactly that, he's a guide, it is not designed as a prescription. Um, but I think if some, suddenly these things would disappear, we'd understand again why they are there. Um, but I've got uh, the New South Wales Government Architect, Abby Galvin, looking this year um, in a very fast manner um, at, uh, at, at, how, um, uh, at, at how we can bring together all the design provisions across, um, across planning law and put them into one principle-based uh, outcomes focused document rather than uh, prescriptive rules uh, but a focus on design continues to be very important but to everyone listening um, please know it's the same process just with more resources uh, so it's not we're not weakening processes here we're just pushing through it uh, faster because we've got more resources that we've pulled from other things so uh, necessarily other things will slow down but that's okay because they're parts of the system or parts of the process that have slowed down because you can't do them anyway. Um, so the whole point of my, 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 uh, my pitch is effectively, we know there are some things we can't do. So let's not focus on those things. Instead, let's pull our resources from those things and put them towards the things we can do. Minister, the committee has been, uh, has made the suggestion that in some cases, um, major projects have been uh, moved to local councils for approval, but those local councils don't have internal capacity to really process it in an effective manner. So um, as, as you know, um, across the LGAs, the internal planning capacity can be quite variable. Um, in some cases, it seems like the way to get both a better outcome and a faster outcome would be for you to take it back and put it through a state approval process. Um, would you consider doing that? Yeah, of course. I mean, we're, we've, we've got um, devices in legislation to do that right now. Um, but of course, um, you know, uh, I think it was someone wise said the only thing we learn from history is we learn nothing from history. Um, remember, when we had 55 precincts uh, all led by the state, that was a recipe for nothing much getting advanced because we were trying to do too many things all at the one time, which was a recipe for nothing getting done. Uh, so that is why we've taken the step of streaming the precincts uh, to make sure, and, and make no mistake, I mean, we've got, you know, the, the ones that are led by the state, uh, once they are done, that will create room for more precincts to move into that stream. But some precincts, there is actually on reflection, no particular reason for the state to be advancing them. In some councils, particularly post in a post-council amalgamation world, some councils now have the resources yeah. uh, to, to partner much more effectively with the state. 
Uh, I mean, a, a classic example um, would be the city for Sydney, for example. Uh, we found that collaborating with the city, the city is, has got incredible resources. Yeah. Uh, we would be silly not to, 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 to take advantage of those resources by working collaboratively with them wherever possible. Minister, we're at 11 o'clock. I would ask, do you have any concluding thoughts to share? Yeah, look, I do, Gabrielle. Thank you so much for the work that the committee does and for uh, the, the, the avenue this provides to talk about important ideas. Uh, my message to everyone listening is, um, uh, I, I assume that those tuning in are, are people who are employed at the moment, and employed in, uh, in construction, in development, in property, in planning, in architecture, in design. Um, what I'd say is our sector um, has a real responsibility right now. Uh, people around the country are looking to us. It's you know it's a real it's a um, it's a real moment of, of patriotism. I know that sounds a bit uh, uh, a bit anachronistic using that word, but we have a duty to work our guts out uh, to keep people in jobs now, to provide some vision, to inspire people who are scared or who are uncertain. Uh, as the seasons change, as we run out of daylight savings and go into winter, there's some bleak months ahead. And it's up to all of us to, to work our guts out uh, like it's never mattered before uh, to provide that vision, uh, to provide direction uh, for people who are scared, who are vulnerable, uh, and to make sure that we create a whole series of opportunities to power our recovery into the 2020s. Minister, thank you so much. And it's very clear this is this is going to be the sector that that leads Australia um, out of lockdown and into the recovery. So thank thanks, you. Gabriel. Okay, everybody, thanks for joining, and we'll see you at the next one. Um, take care.